All right, well, welcome everyone who is uh, there in our audience for uh, 2020, a game-changing year. Uh, so uh, I'm Jack from Bodana. Thank you all for coming out to Save Against Fear, and please enjoy all the wonderful conversation I'm sure that you all are going to have. Uh, so with that, I will uh, take my leave and enjoy everyone, okay? All right. Hi, uh, I'm Barak Blackburn. I've been asked to moderate this. I know some of you, and I will uh, soon know all of you. So the first thing, so this panel is uh, 2020, a game-changing year. And I think it's really important for us to start out and say that uh, unequivocally, the Bodana Group, of which I am a member of the board, uh, supports uh, Black Lives Matter and supports the movement that Black Lives are important. I think that that is one of the big takeaways from 2020. And I just wanted to start with that right off the bat. So um, if that's something you are opposed to, this is probably not the panel for you, not that that's <laughs> all we're going to be talking about, but let's just put it right out there and acknowledge that. And uh, we will also say that systemic racism and white nationalism and white supremacy is also a big thumbs down. So we are uh, not in support of any of those things unequivocally. So Also, with, like uh, trans people or whatever gender they say they are, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yeah, just, absolutely. We'll hammer on all of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But just, I just, I think that those are some important things there. So uh, I am Barak Blackburn. I will be moderating. Uh, I can, I will introduce everyone else uh, going around starting clockwise. Uh, we have, uh, I don't know, who's, who wants to go first here? I don't know what everyone else looks like. So everyone else. So we'll go out, we'll go alphabetically. Alex. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alex Hillman. I am a project manager in the community outreach for Hunters Entertainment. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to chatting with everybody here today and talking about how crazy 2020 has been. It sure has. All right, Dixie. Hi, I'm Dixie Cochran. I am one of the in-house developers at Onyx Path Publishing and the in-house editor. I also do freelancing kind of all across the industry. And uh, I had a lot of fun at Save Against Fear last year, so I'm super excited to be here virtually. Yes, I, I think we're all excited, and I'm, I'm glad to see that there are people here and glad to see some familiar names and faces. Eddie. Uh, my name is Eddie Webb. Uh, I'm also an in-house developer at uh, Onyx Path, um, and I'm a full-time uh, freelancer with my own company, PugSteady.com. Um, and yeah, uh, I... Always been a huge fan of um, Save Against Fear for the past few years I've been coming, so I'm glad that we found a way to keep this rolling, even though it's been a hell of a year. Yeah, it's an but important con, though, as far as, like, what they do. So I'm glad yeah, that absolutely. we're still yeah. supporting Especially the charity. This year. Yeah. Oh, yeah, mental health? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, we can talk about knows, that. <laughs> in, in, case, in case people don't know, uh, the Bodana Group uh, is the organizer of Save Against Fear, and they are a group that uh, advocates and promotes uh, therapeutic gaming. So that's really important here. And especially in a year like this where we've all been sort of dealing with stresses, whether we've been quarantined or whether we've been dealing with the stresses of being outside of quarantine. So I think especially in this year, uh, it is very important. My name is Barak Blackburn. Uh, I do work with Spectrum Games. I was the lead designer on uh, Spectrum superhero games, Capes Cal and Villains Foul, as well as Retro Star. Uh, I have my own little imprint where I publish funny little zine games, and uh, that's called Density Media. And I generally, through my own thing, I usually put out three, four, or five games a year. So uh, I'm working on a couple right now, and we hope to get them out soon. We've already had a couple released this year. So welcome, everyone, uh, to the wonderful year uh, that is 2020. And let's talk about uh, the, the game-changing year that it has been. So uh, obviously, we started out. January, February, you know, things were, things were rocking and rolling. I don't know what sort of, uh, I, I can't even recall what sort of gaming news there was and if there were super, super exciting Kickstarters going out or people securing amazing licenses or anything like that. Oh, hey, our other panelist showed up. Hey, there you go, our last panelist. So we just, you're, you're muted, darling, Luke. I was there you go. Panel. I was literally wondering why there were 10 people talking about role playing games. Okay. <laughs> 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 Hi, Luke. I'm, I'm Barak Blackburn. Uh, I am moderating this panel. If you want to tell everyone who you are, and uh, we, we can jump right in. So, Sure. Sorry to be late, everyone. Um, my name is Luke Peterschmidt. Uh, I'm currently working for AEG as their head of sort of their Kickstarter stuff and on their leadership team. Uh, but I've been in the tabletop game space for about 27 years. Um, nice. I'm, I'm best known for probably designing a game called Bakugan. Um, which I did okay. for a toy company, but you know, I've worked on all kinds of stuff. 
hey, not, nothing wrong with getting paid. So, <laughs> no, no, I love vodka. Awesome. Let's, let's, let's agree for that. So, um, all right. So, so obviously January, February. Uh, again, I, if anyone can recall anything significant in the the realm of tabletop gaming that happened, then uh, you'd be better off than me. I cannot. Obviously, um, you know, when March hit, things things went weird. Things got south. Uh, the date was roughly March 11th that things started to shut down on a mass basis. I think the NBA, uh, the NBA season was in full effect, and that just that shut down, and things things have gone south from there. Um, so that changed the way I think we all do business and we all do pleasure, and uh, you know, and that includes gaming, that includes socializing, that includes getting together with friends, and and gaming is very much part of this. So, um, so I don't know if anyone wants to start off and, and share sort of what some of their thoughts are and, mm. and how it's affected you and whatever. I'm happy to talk, but I'm here to, to help facilitate you all talking. It's going to be like talking to a therapist, right? Like a group therapy session? Because that's kind of what it's yeah, sounds so like I'll right lean now. back and I will twiddle my thumb. <laughs> Let me get my notebook here. Yes, Dixie. <laughs> yes, very interesting. No, go ahead. Uh, so. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be perfectly frank because I'm pretty open about my mental health issues. I was pulling myself out of a really bad depressive slump somewhere around February. Sure. Yep. And uh, as of May of this year, I have gone on Prozac um, <laughs> because that's what this year has been. Like, sure. it seems like, you know, every day a fresh new hell for a little while there. And it's still kind of happening. Um, although now I'm on Prozac, so I don't just curl up in a corner and not work. Um, which is great. Like I'm, I'm more productive than I was. Um, I think most of us that work from home, because like Eddie and I, I know work full-time freelance and did before all this hit, like we were full-time work from home. And a lot of folks kind of, in, including me at the very beginning, were like, this won't affect me. Like I'm used to working from home. This is fine. Right? Like I can just keep on trucking. Like I have been for the past two and a half <laughs> years. And uh, I think most of us fell to like 20 or 30 percent capacity for a little bit there and then have like slowly gotten back up to maybe 60 maybe 70 sure. i don't know yeah. anyone who's been at 100 percent aside from our one freelancer travis leg who thrives off having eight thousand projects well even in travis's offense he was at 150 before now he's down to 100 <laughs> right 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 yeah. <laughs> so so yeah so like i see fans a lot kind of saying like why is this coming out sooner and it's like are you living in the same world we are <laughs> No, but you have all this free time. You should be finishing up projects faster now. You don't have to deal with a commute. No, I'm teasing. No, no, totally. I'm totally joking. <laughs> yeah. I... Well, but I mean, uh, going back to kind of the March thing, to, to build on what Dixie was saying, um, it, I think it weirdly hit people, folks like us who are full-time freelance harder because we thought we could ride it out. It's like, oh, everyone's working from home, but we already work from home and people are having to learn how to change their workflow, but we already have this workflow. And so at least for me, I know um, for a, a couple of months, I thought it was like, well, you know, I'll just kind of ride this through and it'll be fine. And I can help other people accommodate this new normal. And, and I wasn't realizing how much I wasn't adapting to the new normal. Yeah. We were all beating ourselves up yeah. pretty badly for a while there yeah. for like not getting as much done. And then it's like, no, everybody's mental health is in the toilet right now. Mm -hmm. Like sure. even people, who like have regular therapy and are on like it's it's still rough and like it's yeah. something that we need to acknowledge is that like you know if 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 whether it's a freelancer or somebody in my gaming group who's like i just can't today i have to be like mm -hmm. i i get it i totally get you like i can't yeah. force you to like get out of that because i can't go. force myself to get out of that absolutely um can I, can I jump in real quick i think yeah, of I course think, uh, so ag is an all virtual company so we are all essentially are working from home same here know. Anyway, Chronix path. Um, I think it kind of hit us hard. In, I don't, I'm not going to say harder. That's, I don't like being comparative. But um, I think when you work at home, your outside interactions with other humans are like your battery charging. Percent. Right? And oh, when yeah. that went away, I felt like I <laughs> didn't point. have those moments of like, oh, okay, now I can go in my basement and pound out some card designs or marketing tools or whatever, right? And I felt like uh, for people who weren't used to it, they had a different adaption, but I had a hard time with that for sure. Like, I used to spend a lot of time working in coffee shops and going, or like even just like running out to the convenience store for a sandwich, because I'm, I'm a, I live near Wawa, so I'm like a Wawa person. <laughs> so I would like run out to get a sandwich and like, you know, be out of the house for 10 minutes, come back and eat my sandwich and get back to work. But like I got out of the house every day. Um, and yeah, same, same exact thing. Like I liked going out and seeing people even if it was just once a week because that was my time out. And now I've yeah. only seen my boyfriend since March. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's, a same, it's pretty much the same for us over at Hunter's Entertainment. Honestly, mm -hmm. we're uh, a very remote and uh, digital uh, company. So like I myself, I live in Ohio, so I'm 
well across the country from the vast majority of like our core team who is LA based. So um, I think they were probably hit a little bit harder than I was by some of that up front because yeah. they actually had some time to like, you know, interface face to face from time to time. Um, I, I've already was in that kind of remote boat. Um, but I also ran into a lot of uh, general problems that I had to try to figure out how to overcome as well, because it wasn't just, my schedule anymore my wife was now going to be working from home so we mm -hmm. had to be able to figure out how to integrate the other members of the household into mm -hmm. this we're always going to be here how do we end up having meetings with clients and things like that without stepping on each other's toes and all mm -hmm. of that um so there it was a lot more than initially anticipated um and then for me as well like i'm an ambivert by nature so i i was initially expecting to be able to ride it out for a fairly decent amount of time because i was like i don't do tons of social interaction um but even for me at that level like it's the 2020 didn't end like it's, it just keeps going um and it we're is on, march 283rd <laughs> yeah i was like we're like 15 years into 2020 at this point and right. so even as an ambivert i've gotten to the point where i've definitely hit that threshold where i'm like i need other human attention um and it's just it's it's really not a safe situation to be able to do it yeah. so it's yeah it's it's tough um I've really gotten to the point like where I actually like cherish time on zoom conversations, like being able to get with you guys here this evening. It's mm -hmm. honestly fantastic. Cause that's really the closest other than the people in the household that I really get with any kind of actual human interaction. Um, other than some of the things that like we've adopted over the course of 2020 that I'm sure we'll get into like being able to do digital gaming and stuff right. like that mm -hmm. and really diving into that more. So, yeah. Go ahead, Derek. Oh, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, like, I am a hardcore extrovert, as as Eddie will tell you. Uh, <laughs> Eddie and the rest of my company get real annoyed at how chipper I am at the very end of a convention, where I, I'm still like, "Yay, we're doing stuff, we're seeing people," and they're all like, "We want to go home," and I'm like, "No, no, 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 we're still here. It's not done yet." Um, I like I I man the booth at all of our cons because I can talk to 200 people a day and have a great time doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and having that taken away from me has been like the thing I'm the most upset about. At, at, at 2020. I mean, not the most upset about politics, obviously, and fires and all the actual real world stuff, but as far as my personal mental health, yeah. um, the like not having those convention outlets has been so rough because even these, like, they're great and I'm glad we can talk to people and I'm glad we can do chats and everything, but I want to stand at the booth and like talk about my games and go out for drinks with my friends afterwards and play, like, play a pickup game of something in a lobby or like invite to someone's hotel room to play werewolf, whatever. I don't care. Like, just all the stupid, yeah. like, stuff we had to get cons. And, like, you know, me, me, me and my boyfriend were big, like, cocktail people. We live right outside of D.C. So, like, we have a great foodie scene here. And it was like, oh, let's go have some cocktails on the weekend. Let's go walk around the national parks, whatever, yeah. walk around the monuments. And, like, we've been to D.C. a couple times since this all started, but I bet you can guess why. <laughs> <laughs> it's called protesting. Hands yep. fast, um, not for drinks. Yes. Literally yep. the only thing that has convinced us to forego the safety of the apartment to go down into D.C., was to go yeah. protest for you know people's lives so it's like that's that's great but it's not fun <laughs> yeah it's not, it was cool to be around people i guess but it wasn't like Say i was like. having a great time <laughs> not yeah. not at the protest but everybody was masked they were all very good in dc yeah. But yeah yeah no it was just a whole lot of like i wish we could just be mingling like normal people but we're here yeah. for a reason yeah I, so i really, so, really miss the conventions interaction with customers. i know like so much of what um, what I do is I try to see what people like and what they don't like and what people are into and and what is there too much of and what is there not enough of and now I feel like companies are really throwing darts at the board and saying I don't know are zombies does anyone like is there a hundred zombie games we launched a pirate game this year and I it was like five other pirate games been two weeks of us and it was just oh. now that was not decisions that everyone made this year that was just bad timing yeah. I mean we launched a pirate game this year I won't talk about it I'm sorry no that's fine <laughs> pirates, are, <laughs> pirates. I've, I've got it right here yeah um, yes yes product oh, place all the product <laughs> place very good <laughs> um so I, I I live and work at a school like a boarding school and uh when March started, so we were on our March break, and um, we never came back. 
and I was the only person on campus proper for about, so March, April, May, June. So for four months, I was like the man in the lighthouse. I would like tour the buildings to make sure there was no fires or sprinklers or anything like this. And it was just me, like all alone. I practically was like putting on my Charlton Heston attire and running around like the last man on earth. And I live in a, I live in like a historic community. Mm -hmm. So it's already very quiet as it is. <laughs> so mm -hmm. like, it was like, you know, oh, I think I heard a car, you know, once a day, you know, that would drive by or something. It was very, very quiet. Um, myself personally, of course, I, like all of you, I, I missed so much stuff, but I found that I was able to sort of channel some of that into uh, both hosting games. I wrote a couple mini games that were part of a bundle and, and worked on other stuff. I'm super disappointed. We, we had a Kickstarter for the zine quest and uh, we were basically like 90% ready, but th some of the stuff we wanted to do involved being together in person for my uh, sort of co-creator. And so we have not been able to do that. So I'm super bummed that we can not sort of finish that, that up and, and finish that out. But I found a lot of joy in sort of, I have played more games in the, since March than I normally have in multiple calendar years. I'm sure like many of you, I, you know, sort of my, my personal playing time is not nearly as much as I'd like because I have real life going on. And so I've been mm -hmm. able to do stuff. I, I hosted readings for people. I would read entire scripts for people. Doug Lewandowski, who I'm sure many of you know, he hosted, oh, Doug. Um, oh, yeah. he hosted a Macbeth thing, which he does every year at school. And so nice. I, similar to this, sort of served as the, the host of that uh, using our Zoom account. And, you know, uh, so I've done a lot of stuff like that, which I've found, and I, I'm not saying this to say like, hey, you know, look at me, but more like I found sort of strength and joy in doing that and reaching out to people. And I, mm -hmm. I brought a bunch of people from California, several in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, where I am together. Most of them didn't know each other. And we played uh, like a campaign that ended like three weeks ago. And that was like every other week. So that was awesome to do that. And that, that gave me a lot of... Uh, sort of fun seeing people on a, on a, a bi-weekly basis and I missed them already because it was a campaign that sort of ended. Um, so, yeah. you know, I, so, you know, but that, that was really great. I, I imagine like most of you, we, you know, we've discussed conventions, obviously we're at one, but then you think of like something like Gen Con where you go to see all these people mm -hmm. and that like sort of the second or third week of August, I was like, man, like, you know, you just sort of, yep. you, you miss the whole, and for me, it's always a, a trip, you know, we, we drive out, we get fun foods along the way, we try and stop and see new things. So it was just like, man, I miss, I miss the sweet cream pie. I miss this, or I miss the, you know, Cincinnati chili. So, yeah. Know. Yes. No. I miss you know, Harry and Izzy's shrimp cocktails. Shrimp cocktail, yeah. yes! Yes! <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes! I was talking to my boyfriend about just like buying a horseradish root and just grating it into a thing of cocktail sauce and seeing if we could recreate it. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, you can yeah. you can get the the Saint Elmo's. It's not as potent. So not try. as potent. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just didn't know if you knew that you could get <laughs> no, that. we we have tried it. It is She's not as it. spicy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. No. So my big uh, non-working convention every year is Dragon Con in Atlanta. Uh, that's the one I go to every year with my best friend, and we do cosplay, and we go to parties, and we hang out, and we do not like. I am not there to work. Um, yeah. Great. I, I might see someone I work with. Like, I like hung out with it, you know, any very briefly, things like that. But, like, I don't go there to work. And, of course, like, all of us are sitting there going, like, cancel it, cancel it, cancel it, give my money back, cancel it. Mm -hmm. We're not going anyway. They finally did. But, luckily, my Dragon Con cosplay group was able to get together on a Zoom call. So, like, we didn't dress up, but just seeing each other. Like, people I've known for 12 years, 14 years, was really refreshing because I hadn't seen any of them in so long. And I just moved to Maryland where I'm, like, less than an hour from two of them that I thought I would be seeing on the regular this summer. <laughs> and I have not seen them at all since I moved here. And I'm like, no. Sure. Um, so, I mean, that's a, a, that's a great segue to sort of like how, how have you all dealt sort of on the non-business end, but sort of on the personal end of gaming and socializing? I mean, some people, even non-gamers are, are not so much now because a lot of places have gone to phase three or whatever. But phase one and phase two were doing like uh, virtual happy hours where they would get together. I just a while ago got together with some people I hadn't seen since college, a bunch of RAs I was RA with. And, oh, and cool. you know, funnily, some of them live like within half an hour of me, but I haven't seen them since then. So we just recently got right. together. But mm -hmm. how have you all been dealing with sort of both the gaming and the personal sort of like getting together with friends virtually? And how, how have you found successes, failures, and how's that work for you? 
Um, I'll be honest, for a while, I was not doing well. Um, I did not realize how much, because I am generally an introvert, as Dixie pointed out, um, but I didn't realize how much the, the connection I needed was really relevant to ground me. Um, like the act of, like you said before, like the act of going to a convention and being around the social space and coming back, that, that kind of ritual of, you know, the plane there and the plane back or the car ride there and the car ride back. Um, but even just things like going out to the coffee shop. Um, and uh, so I, I struggled for a while, like for, for several months. Um, and I just didn't want to talk to anybody because I, I just, I was getting really anxious about the whole process. I was like, I don't know how to do this. And gaming was kind of the same boat. It's like, you know, for 20 years, I've been like, oh, sure, here's five strangers. I'll go ahead and run a game, no problem, because I'm just used to the convention scene. Um, and I've been gaming with some of my friends for four or five years now, um, but I just couldn't do it until fairly recently. Um, and, you know, like I said, I went to therapy and I kind of got talked through that, but I think a lot of it was the fact that um, it is so different and recognizing that while we can do this kind of cool Zoom thing and we can get more people around the world, it took me several months to realize this is exhausting. Um, to do things in this manner. It's like, yes, we have this technology, this great way of staying in touch with people, but it is different and we as humans are not wired to interact in this way. And so it, everything takes a little bit more effort and a little bit more thing. And everything's a little bit awkward. Um, yeah. And once I kind of recognized that and realized, okay, well, everyone feels this way. You know, everyone's kind of like, well, Zoom is what it is. And everyone feels like everyone's staring at them constantly all of the time while you're on the Zoom call. And it's like, okay, cool. Then it's not just me. And it helped me to kind of loosen up and realize, okay, we're going to talk over each other and we're going to stumble. Yeah. Um, and it's been, it's been better then after that. I read a few articles about it that I was, I was talking to Eddie about where like Zoom is more exhausting than an in-person meeting because you don't know who's looking at you. Mm -hmm. So like at an in-person meeting, you occasionally, like if you need to scratch your nose or you need to like not look like you're on for like three seconds, you can do that because you can kind of go, okay, no one's looking at me. Right. Okay. Like, you know, back, back to it. Um, but when you're on Zoom, like I, I was in customer service for 15 years before I went to full-time freelancing and it very much feels like working at Sephora again, where I'm like, like this, this is my face. This is my neutral face. Like this, this has to be my neutral face and nobody thinks I'm mad at them because if I'm not actively smiling, I look sad because that's how my face is shaped. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like, ah, ha, ha, everything's great. Um, and it's, it, it can be exhausting. Um, I'm actually really glad that the weekly game I'm in, cause we, we play B5. Um, and the weekly game I'm in is audio only. So I can be in like my PJ pants and my hair pulled back and no makeup on and just kind of like talk as my character. Um, I, I do miss seeing people's facial expressions and like hands and things, but I think that it's just more comfortable for all of us. So, yeah. So I think that outfit you just mentioned is called business casual now, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I've been fully, fully dressed on a Zoom call in a while. Like I've actually got shoes on and it's because yeah. I went outside right before we started. <laughs> um, and like I am not wearing slippers for once on a Zoom call and it actually feels a little weird. You know, one of the things we did at AEG early on is we, I actually, I instituted formal Fridays where we all wore um, ties and formal wear. Nice. Uh, just I love we, that. We have a daily call. And uh, we started, we implemented some live games. We took a look at all the games we'd made and we said, which ones can we play on Zoom um, and broadcast and change the rules enough that our fans can play along with us. So Ooh. every day at like 3 p.m. we'd play Tiny Towns or we'd play Space Base like we did today. And, uh, and it was a nice way to sort of get to our fans and see what they needed and give them a little bit of like, oh, you can play games with people yeah. again. But personally, the most fun I've had is there's a game called Just One, Just Once. It's a very simple party game, um, hmm. but you could play it on a Zoom call with people you've never met before, teach them the rules in two minutes, and it's a great like way to get everyone excited again um, and playing a game where you're engaged, but it's not too thinky, and it can be a cocktail hour, so you can be drinking a little bit if that's your thing. Um, so yeah, I've been trying to find those things that work well. Uh, my daughter's in college right now, my oldest daughter in, in Philly, and it's great when she decided to play like a game with me today while we all played at AG. It's fun. Awesome. What about you, Alex? I mean, uh, one of the big things that I've been kind of leaning into is actually, and it's it's nice that at Hunters we've kind of always been pushing for a more technological approach and mixing that with gaming. Um, so we've got like a Discord server and all mm -hmm. that stuff, much like you guys over at Onyx Path have. And being able to just have that more direct and fairly constant connection with like our community 
um, has been one of the things that's been really fulfilling for me. Um, I actually, I, I've, I've noticed that since everything kind of kicked off, I've definitely like poured myself into like our chat and just randomly responding to just about anything that comes in so many mind. discords yeah. i'm in so many discords just to like bullshit i'm like here's a meme enjoy it yeah just <laughs> validate me let me interact with somebody please so yeah, yeah it's uh, i'm i'm very grateful for that um and like yeah hunters we've been doing things like uh we finally launched a twitch channel uh ourselves now so like we're streaming content twice a week where um we actually uh, just recently partnered up with uh, Foreteller, and we actually just got to uh, debut the uh, software that we were working on with them that allows for some uh, fan, like the community can actually interact with the game and play the game essentially alongside the people that we have streaming in the cast. Um, so like right now we started up an Outbreak Undead show, mm -hmm. um, which is very apropos in the current uh, environment. Like we've, we've actually found with that game that it's actually kind of ramped up uh, a bit since all of this kicked off because I think people find it a bit cathartic. I played so much Plague Inc. the like week the pandemic started. It yeah, was just like, like for just... some reason my, 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 my brain was like, pandemic, must understand it. Play <laughs> Plague Game. And it gives you a sense of agency with it a little bit more because like all of us kind of feel helpless with this whole situation because we essentially are. Um, and by doing these more fantasy approaches to like different types of outbreaks or even with like zombies and stuff like that, it, it gives you that sense of agency that you can like fight back and try to put an end to it or have some kind of actual sense of control over your own destiny again. Um, and I think that's what a lot of people are probably struggling with right now. So yeah, that's the show that we decided to kind of kick this all off with. And so like our, our audience can be like members of this stronghold that the cast are a part of, and they can go out and do missions by earning time from watching and stuff like that. It's all integrated in with our software. So, um, we've been looking into things like that as well to just kind of, further invest in technology at this point as a tabletop company and figure out ways to incorporate that a little bit more directly into everything that we do because it, it once all things go back to normal, which I, I think we're all desperate for at this point, we can go back to physical conventions. I think there's still going to be room for like online cons and things like that. Um, so I think that this is that's the one positive real takeaway that I think we can take from 2020 in that regard is that for at least with our industry, we've, we've opened up some new doors that I don't think are going to close again when all of this finally comes to an end. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. And I think that, that, I mean, that, that's true in so many ways, just across the board, you think about, you know, businesses that are going to just have a tiny little office now and they, you know, going from like, well, we needed three floors to be like, we did fine. You know, we're more productive. We did whatever. Yeah, um, my, my oh, boyfriend yeah. used to go to work every day from like 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. And now he is home every other week and only gets to work for a few hours on his on weeks. And like, he's fine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I have a friend who used to have to commute like two hours, three times a week and like worked home the other days and everyone's been working home. So my fingers are crossed for him that he gets to keep doing that if yeah. things ever revert back to normal. Um, so how have you found the gaming to be if, if you've been doing it? And I know that, you know, it varies for everyone, but role-playing games, story games, board games, you know, all that sort of stuff. I think there, there are indeed some challenges. Have you had challenges or has it just been sort of seamless for you? And, and I mean, I know, I know a bunch of people, online gaming was all they did before, and so now they're just doing more of it. So, um, so I, I mean, for myself, I tend to run very rules-like games. I might hold up a picture and say, hey, this is something. And I, when the game I ran, I sometimes had like a Google Doc going so people could follow along if I had stuff or like a Google Slideshow that I could share with them while I was running the game. But in general, you know, I don't worry about dice rolls. I don't worry about maps. It, you know, it's not, they're, they're not sort of tactile games in that sense. They're sort of theater of the imagination. But certainly for board games, I know people have set up rigs or they set up a, a like an iPad above a game so they can follow along. And obviously there's, uh, various, uh, you know, online things that allow you to play games and people create, you know, widgets for them and stuff. So, but I'm wondering how each of you sort of dealt with that and uh, pluses and minuses. I've been playing a fair number of games on Tabletop Simulator. 
Okay. Um, but most of those games I'm playing are uh, game submissions to the company or games we're working on. So that feels more like work. And the interface, it, it, it's good training for what the interface is because it really does suck a lot of the joy out of the game. Like part of the joy of tabletop gaming is sitting across from the person you're gaming with and yep. you pick up their little micro expressions on their face and you laugh at jokes and, you know, people accidentally drop things or whatever. It's just, it's just more, more fun that way. Um, I played some D20 online. Roll D20, I think it's called. Yep. We yeah. had a Cthulhu campaign. That was pretty fun. Yep. But still not nearly as, as, as fun as in person. I think for me, the big thing is that my games have become simpler. Um, yeah. The big, heavy, chunky board games, which were sometimes fun to spend three hours on, are not for online play, right? I need yeah. something lighter and faster in and out. Um, but that's just me. Yeah, I mean, uh, so can I follow up there? Has that changed... What you guys, what you all at, at AEG are doing as a company, are you looking to sort of maybe get into to design games like that? You know, thinking, you know, has, have, has that been part of discussion sort of thinking like, hey, this has been a lot of fun. What can we do in this realm or area? In a very, very big way, this is not just AEG, this is the whole industry Absolutely. For, for tabletop, is uh, focus on solo game players. Yep. There are a lot of people who play board games on their own. And it's not something we've ever really focused on until fairly recently. And it's been super rewarding. Um, it's hard to sell a game to folks now and say, oh, you and your three friends get together for three hours over beers and play this game. Because that's just not believable. Mm -hmm. So we can sell them games now that have a solo version. And when things get better, we can say, and then you can play with everybody when, when things get better. Uh, that's definitely true. And these kind of games like Tiny Towns and Space Base that we figured out how to play online with 500 people at a time, that was a novelty before. Now it's definitely a feature. If you're pitching AEG a game and it's the kind of game that I can play with 500 people online, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a winner. Um, nice. Even if they have to have their own copy and they're just, you know, we're sharing dice rolls or whatever slight modifications. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's definitely affected. I, I will say real quick that when we're talking industry, tabletop as a whole, most companies either didn't survive, which is totally understandable, um, or they're killing it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are buying a lot of games right now. Um, yeah. I think they've lost their other sources of ways to spend money. They don't go to eat. Um, they just have a little bit more expendable income. And the idea of playing a game, and if they're at home with the family members or, or you know, uh, yeah. a, a, a group you're, you're quarantined with, yeah, it's nice to have something to do. Yeah, we honestly weren't sure how a lot of our Kickstarters were going to do when all this started because we're like, well, we still like that. That's because that's how we, we run a lot of our game sales is we, we do a Kickstarter and that's how we achieve more like stretch goals and more, more games and more add-ons and things. And we were like, these might not go off this summer. Like we just, but, like, honestly, they've all done really well. And I think it is be for that exact reason. Like I was just telling my, my uh, colleagues recently, like I bought a bunch of new clothes the other day because I kind of looked around and I was like, I haven't bought clothes in like eight months. Yeah. And I haven't gone out to a bar, like, I used to bartend, so we've been doing some cocktails at home, but that's about the extent of it, and that's way cheaper than going out. Yeah. Um, and, like, I, I was like, man, I, I have a bunch of extra money that, like, I don't usually yeah. have. So if I spend 400 bucks on some clothes, like, I don't feel bad about that. Like, I can wear them next year on the convention circuit. In fact, this is a brand new dress that I'm wearing for Save Against Fear because I haven't worn it yet because where am I going to wear it? Um... Speaking of Kickstarters, we have one on right now. Oh, look at that <laughs> Throw that up there. You know, you got uh, uh, 21 minutes left. Thunderstorm. All right, hey, there you go. You should uh, Gosh, really? share, share the link in the, the chat there. So throw, throw that link there. Oh, sure. I'll throw a link in. That's yeah, throw a link in. Absolutely. <laughs> Had to do that for... <laughs> yeah, no, I would say that, I would say that as a company, um, Onyx Path has always been pretty good about producing narrative RPGs. So a lot of our games do lend themselves really well to playing on discords and things. I know that fans have developed dice rollers, stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's pretty easy to play our games, either uh, just via Discord or via like Astral Tabletop or, you know, some of the other systems that are out there. Um, that said, I think that the main thing this summer has actually got done for us, which is also a question in the Q&A, um, was somebody asked how we plan on making our, our how we plan to make our games more diverse going forward, especially in light of all the stuff this summer. Um, and, and Black Lives Matter and what have you. And I think we've always been committed to diversity as far as our characters, as far as our games, as far as getting cultural consultants for the games that need them. But I think that we're hitting that hammer way harder now at, at Onyx Path. Uh, we've taken a good hard look at everybody. I know that currently you're looking at two white cisgender people 
through are representing the company. Um, that's how it is right now. Hopefully somehow it will be forever. We, our writers are very, very diverse. Our freelancers are very, very diverse. Our developers are very, very diverse. Uh, the top like three people happen to be white. And I feel bad about that sometimes and often. Um, but we're, we're thinking about it. We're actually re releasing some stuff for scarred lands to change the way that races work uh, or to give you optional rules, much like D&D did. We're also changing uh, a, a few things in some upcoming books, uh, even editing books over the summer. Uh, my, <laughs> I was editing a book uh, that dealt with the Cthulhu mythos, and at first I was a little bit like, I feel like this developer was hitting the hammer of like him being racist a little too hard, even though H.P. Lovecraft was terribly racist and was awful. But like after, when I went back and finished it like two months later, I was like, oh no, no, I agree with all this. Like, I don't know why I was being so like scared white lady before. Um, and yeah, it was like, I don't want to rock the boat. And then after May, it was like, oh no, we need to rock the boat. Like, duh, obviously. Um, so yeah, I think that that's a lot of where Onyx Path has gone this summer. So although we are releasing some solo play rules for, I think, Scion Demigod and a few other things. Yep. Um, yeah, Very so we are cool. doing some solo play rules, but I, I think the main thing that we've been doing is looking at the content of our books, um, which I think we've been doing pretty well, and we just want to make sure that we're doing exceptionally wherever we can. Sure. Uh, so we have lots and lots of, like I said, cultural consultants, various internal people that we run stuff by, um, various diversity and sensitivity readers, just trying, and like, it, paying them, <laughs> like trying to make sure that everything is as sensitive as it can be, especially when we're handling tough subjects or writing about a culture of which we're not part. Sure. Now, let me, can we, uh, so, so for a minute, we, I mean, I thought it was a great question. Let's talk about sort of like the, so a lot of this came about with the sort of orc thing with, with Wizards of the Coast and D&D &D mm -hmm. and sort of like some of the pushback as, uh, you know, some of these topics that are in our lives now regularly sort of bubbled to the surface and people were like, hey, wait a second. And uh, I don't know, like, if people want to sort of chat about that or talk about that and uh, sort of, you know, how that sort of made us all look at, at things that, that, you know, so for the longest time, orcs were evil, you know, and you have, you know, sort of this whole thing here. And then, you know, as I have theories as to, to some of this stuff, and not they're not sinister tinfoil hat theories, but sort of the, you know, as we've, you know, said that, you know, players can play orcs now, now orcs are no longer, you know, evil. They're not, you know, imbued with a sense of evil within them, you know, and that's sort of the Tolkien orcs were literally crafted from evil, you know, so you sort of go from that to like, well, orcs are humanoids, and that means they have sort of opinions, and, and as a former colleague of mine said, uh, I have feelings, which means my feelings can be hurt, you know, so you sort of take these things that were monsters, and now they're not monsters anymore, they're, they're people, and, um, you know, and you sort of, it, I find, you know, so I find some of this stuff very interesting, and, and safety tools are a big thing in games, and, uh, and, and they're great, and then you sort of talk about stuff like this, and, and so many games really rely upon sort of combat as a sort of main thing. And, and then when you, when you put a, a human face on it, on mm -hmm. the orc, you know, sort of that Roddenberry style, it's a human being under that orc mask, then it gets weird, you know? So I don't know what, what people are thinking about that. I, you know, this, a lot of the stuff I design is not based on sort of killing and combat, um, just because that's sort of the genres that I'm going with. And, uh, you know, I don't know if we want to talk about that sort of orcs, violence, killing, and, and all that, and sort of how it's changed our view, you know, having witnessed murder of people, you know, sort of, you know, live stream, like, right. oh, look, here's, you know, this person being murdered, that's terrible, does it make us think about, you know, sort of our games and what we're presenting to people and, and all that, so if anyone wants to chime in, feel free. I don't want to talk the whole time, but I feel like I have thoughts. I, I, yeah, share yeah, your I, thoughts, I, we have time. I did, I, yeah. I think the, the, the problem to me comes from ascribing a trait like evil or malicious to an entire group of sentient people. Like, you can have an evil person. There are evil people in the world. There are people that have committed evil acts. Um, a lot of them are white. Um, but, like, that doesn't make all white people evil. Like, like, because of Hitler, not all white people are evil. Right? Sure. Because yeah. of, like, one shitty orc, not all orcs are evil. Yep. So if you want to fight a shitty orc who's trying to, like, murder innocent people, that's one thing. But to say, like, orcs have negative two intelligence because they're big, dumb brutes, like, that's racist. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's kind of where you have to look at the line. 
uh, one of our games, uh, Exalted, deals with that a lot, and it's about like trying to always trying to do the right thing or be a hero, and how that blows up in your face a lot because of your own hubris or your own, you know, thinking you're doing good but not understanding the, the nuance of the situation. Um, and I think that more games could benefit from that kind of play, personally, where it's like, you need to think about the nuance of what's happening. Like, okay, so you took out the evil warlord, evil warlord, like, how are his people going to eat now? So, yeah. Did, I, did I, you think about that? Yeah. I, I, I think there's definitely a connection to 2020 and and the, the Black Lives Matter movement in particular, to showing a lot of people who look like us that a lot of complaints that we had heard, but not quite realized, we didn't disbelieve, but we didn't know the extreme of the of the truth that was being said to us. And we've all had to deal with it. And I think that's made a lot of us look at our products and say, I need to check some things. I need to, I need to make sure that, um, you know, this is working. And at the same time, we have to be able to have an evil person who's Hitler, right, in, in our stories. But any good writer, right, is going to make their evil people logical, right? Mm -hmm. Darth Vader had logic to him. Right? Yeah. He was a logical guy, but he was a bad guy. He um, also got but, redeemed. He had a redemption arc. He did. He did. Yeah. But even if he didn't, like, there's a rash. Like, even if you get into, you know, people who are abused as children and then wake, like, if you're watching any serial killer stuff mm -hmm. on TV, right? Um, like, even historical stuff. There's traits that help make those people understandable, mm -hmm. right? And I think when we look at our products, unfortunately, for tabletop games in particular, we don't have a lot of verbiage, not a lot of space to write these long descriptions of, who this character is, who's a villager who collects wheat. Like, he's just a person on a card. So then we're at a different level, which is let's make sure we show the people on the card so they represent our, our players. Right. Uh, we can. Like, we did this pirate game, and it's there. We wanted to be kind of historic. So the skin tones and the way people looked in that game were historically accurate, and everyone thanked us for being so diverse in our presentation. <laughs> and I'm like, we worked. Like, we, we did it, even though it was a slightly fantasy world, include people that wouldn't belong we we just showed it how it really was and that yeah. shows you how far off our baseline is that people oh, thought yeah. we did it on purpose i'm like no we just made them yeah. look like people in the caribbean have you been there <laughs> my, <laughs> my friend chris spivey who did harlem unbound uh just did a haunted west game and like yeah. a lot of cowboys were black and hispanic yeah. And yeah. so a lot of his cowboys are black and Hispanic. People are like, oh, he's making a black cowboy game, like his Harlem Bound game. And it's like, no, 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 no. He's making an accurate cowboy game. <laughs> yeah. Just like he made an accurate Harlem game. <laughs> yeah. What, 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 Eddie, you got really quiet. I can't hear you at all. Oh, no. No, can't hear you, Eddie. You're muted. No, he's not muted. His mic's having trouble. Yeah, your, your mic just like cut out, man. Oh, no. Oh, no. No. Nope. Now, okay. Try now. Nope. Eddie and I have like professional mics because we do a podcast and we can't hear each other. No. Too much. Nothing yet. No. So keep keep talking, Eddie. We'll hear you when we hear you. Okay. Um. So I th I think it's I think you know sort of we can look at things and we can we can look at the past and we can look at you know content we've created. And we can look forward and we can look at content where are, we are going to create and sort of, you know, think about stuff. And I know um, someone released a game that, you know, it kickstarted like a year and a half ago and they just released it. And then reviews came out. They're like, your orcs are bad. <laughs> and they were like, well, change it. We can't, you know, like we've been working yeah. on this game for a year and a half, you know. So, you know, it's one of those things. And so I think, you know, for a lot of people, we, we can look at stuff now. And, and so undead now make great enemies. Undead or evil. You know, we can say, kill the undead. They're, they're bad guys. Once, um, once, once you're actually talking about, like, a thing without a soul that is supernatural, that's a little bit different. Yeah. yeah. And then you have your Saturday morning cartoons where it's okay to cut robots in half. Well, and that's Cartoon Action Hour, which, which both Eddie and I have, have worked on, where, you know, you just you knock a guy out, you know, and bam, yeah. and they fall down, and that's it, you know, so, um, yeah. you know, you have that sort of stuff there. Um, you know, but I think, I think it's very interesting, I think, you know, um, you know, the, the orcs thing with Watsi, I think, on one hand, sort of got out of control, and on the other hand, it didn't get out of control. I think it was an important discussion to be had about sort of the, you know, you know, ourselves becoming sort of numb to the idea of just killing things, you know? Like, well, I, I feel like, like can, you, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Zoom was being weird. Um, I feel like th that overcorrection was necessary. I feel like you had to take yeah. that conversation really far out to get people yeah. to listen, and then we could walk it to a place that actually pushes it forward and, and, and moves the conversation forward. Um, 
On the flip side, though, a lot of these conversations aren't new. They may be new to a lot of people hearing them, um, but these are conversations that have been happening in industry for easily two decades. Mm -hmm. um, the whole not everyone in the race is evil thing, that goes back to Dritz de Worden, you know, in, in the Forgotten Realms, yep. you know, the, the, the one not evil drow. And the, if you read the novels, the novels are basically, well, no, the society makes them into this. Also, Lyriel from uh, Elaine Cunningham's yeah. uh, a drow series was, was, was my first, like, drow that I read because it was a female main character. Right. And, like, same thing. Like, she had golden eyes, not red eyes. So she was special. And she was not evil <laughs> because right. that's how characters are. Um, and and yeah. dips eyes were purple, so obviously the eye color is relevant. You know, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have brown eyes, so I can't be evil. Exactly. Um, but also, I mean, just things like um, uh, I started working on Pugmire in 2006, 2017. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do with it is like I wanted it to be a stealth allegory for talking about uh, xenophobia and racism. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's really weird to me because now people are, are coming up to the game today and going, oh, this is a Black Lives Matter allegory. And it's like, it, it's not <laughs> because it, it black lives matter existed around that time but i wasn't thinking about that i was thinking about the fact that people are shitty to each other and have a shitty to each other for thousands of years mm -hmm. and here's a cool way that we can kind of talk about that and then the rest of society kind of blew up and people are going oh i want to play this out through the dogs being mean to the cats and that's not inherently a good thing just because you can't be mean just because they're a cat um, and so I've had so many parents come to me and say they've been able to use Pugmire as a way to kind of talk with their kids about these things in a relatively, you know, uh, uh, non-explosive way. And then they can lead up to the, the harder conversations. Yeah. Um, and it's cool that they, that they could do that with the game, um, but it's not tapping into a current zeitgeist by intention. It's making good games that addresses the kinds of things that people want to do to each other and then making – go back to your the thing you're saying, Luke, about we just did good research, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, oh, it's, it's, we live in such an interesting world where I, I, what I don't, what I hope doesn't happen is that people are afraid to tell stories with, um, with bad kids. So when I was a kid, this is a great example. Uh, my, my family has a long civil rights background, like mm -hmm. to the point where when I grew up in Florida, uh, this is the late six, uh, early seventies, uh, before I was born, my family lived there. Our plan was that when the riots would happen, the kids from our house would go over to the, the Jeffersons, who are next door neighbors, who are black, and we'd swap kids so that whichever mob showed up at the door, the right colored kids could answer, right? So wow. we lived this, wow. this the kind of, kind of life I've always lived. So when I watched the movie Jesus Christ Superstar when I was young, yes. um, and I'm like, huh, there's only one um, uh, black character and he's Judas. And I'm like, ow. Yeah. But then I heard him sing and I thought, you know what? <laughs> he deserved the role and I would hate to see him not get the role for that reason. They did right. a so for a long time actually. JC Superstar had a tradition of having their Judas be like the black character, um, which is why the live version from a couple of years ago with John Legend was so awesome to me. Was because it was just a completely diverse cast. Yeah, yeah. Like just all all across the board diverse, and so I t to me it was more compelling because I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm not like slightly uncomfortable by the fact that the you know bad guy is the only non-white person on yes. this cast. Yeah. Yeah, I would just hate to see a world where a, a really talented uh, mm -hmm. actor or singer of color um, doesn't get a role because it's the villain in a in a thing. No, totally. Because those are the juicy yeah. roles for actors and actresses anyway. <laughs> the fun totally. Ones. So I want to make sure that I judge things by the story and then I judge industries by the industry. Mm -hmm. And you judge things by the song. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but the industry is the industry. We have a problem and we need to address it as industry leaders. I mean, we are literally five white people talking about this as far as I can tell. Like, I don't know everybody's ethnic yeah. background, but like, we all look like white people, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. And is that is not, like, that's, that's, that's something that I feel like I should say just for the uh, why going to be in the future. Like, we don't speak for any people of color. This right. is just no, our that, experiences. That's, I, I, I specifically asked Jack if he could, you know, try and rustle up someone who might be interested who could, I mean, because again, I can't, all I can say is Black Lives Matter, down with white supremacy, but I can't speak to any experience outside mm -hmm. of that. But uh, we I, can't, I, we I, can't take actions, though. And I think that's but, important. Yes. We take action, but I mean, but 2020 is so rooted in, you know, everything that's happening in the outside world yeah. and to sort of to, you know, I just, I think it's important for us to address it. I think the works is a nice segue to that discussion to sort of look at yeah. things and be like, hey, you know, here's, you know, let's, let's talk about this. And, and as with anything, it can be an allegory for, you know, something mm -hmm. else. Um, if, if you don't mind, though, I'd like to actually spin this a slightly different direction um, in that the other thing that 
hasn't been talked about a ton is how to make games compelling inside of the COVID environment. Um, because like, I know, for example, I'm running a modern day game and I kind of had to stay up front. Okay, this is set in 2019. Yep, our vampire game is 2018. Right. Um, and uh, right now we're in the process of developing a uh, kind of cyberpunk game for Onyx Path. And one of the things that was pitched before COVID happened was, okay, it, it, the, the conceit is everyone has a brain implant and so everyone can kind of has their home office in their head. Um, and so an issue is going to be kind of an allegory about what it's like to be a freelancer. Um, but then we started actually hitting developments when COVID hit. And so we started having a lot of conversations about how do you design a city where not everyone needs to have a central meeting place. And then we started talking. Originally, I was like, well, then we don't need any of this stuff. But then as started COVID rolling on, it's like, actually, no, we probably actually need to build places where people to physically meet and give them reasons to do that. Um, and so a lot of the way the game was designed was absolutely shaped by our lived experience of, of living through lockdowns. Um, and that's something that I think any modern day game coming out in the next year or so is going to really struggle with. It's like, is this now? Because if it is now, a lot of the default narrative structures we assume just don't work anymore for, for tabletop games. So we either have to do it in kind of a nebulous, well, it's now, but before COVID, or it's going to be a few years in the future when this is all done. Or um, COVID never happened. Right, or COVID, or alternate universe where this just never happens. Right. Um, that's, that's how our aberrant game set up. It's like, you know, just 2018 took a different turn, you know? Yeah, because um, we had already written it before this. <laughs> well, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so that's another huge struggle, but also I think we're going to start seeing games in the next six months, a year, uh, as designers are thinking about living in the space and what that brings to our table. So I mean, not only on mechanical levels, like, like Luke and I have been talking about, but also I think on a content level of what kinds of games are going to be interesting to play. Like, I think part of the reason maybe why Pirates are popular is because it's the, I can go out and, you know, it's like, I take my house and go somewhere else with my house. That's basically what pirates are. You're taking your house with you on the, on the, on the ocean. So, I mean, that's kind of a, right now, a, a good fantasy to have. It's like, I can go somewhere and still be safe inside of my space. Do you the think, absolute do you agency think any, of it. Do you think, real quick on that, because it's, I love the idea that you're making games in this space and how if you tried to set a game in 2021, nobody knows what that looks like. Right. Do yeah. you think people are just going to jump 10 years ahead or 10 years behind and just avoid trying to craft, guess that narrative? I find this fascinating. I, 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 I personally think what's going to happen is I think we're going to get the two extremes. I think we're going to see a lot more historical games popping up. Um, I think a lot more historical fiction popping up mm -hmm. uh, as people look back to a combination of what went well in the past and also using the past to re-examine current tensions, like uh, Lovecraft Country is a good example right now on HBO, mm -hmm. um, using the past to also look at, hey, this is why our current environment also sucks. Um, but also projecting, I think we're going to see more sci-fi popping up. Um, and we're going to see more like, okay, yeah, 10, 10 years of the future, you know, uh, Max Hedrum style, you know, 10, 15 minutes in the future kind of stuff. Um, uh, I, I think some people might be brave enough to try to assume it's going to happen next year or so, but we all know the development cycle of, of products and media. By the time you do that, so much will change. I mean, heck, people were trying to prognosticate in March and April what August and September were going to look like, and we were completely wrong. Um, yeah. So I just think that... Um, we'll flatten the curve by June. It'll be fine. <laughs> we'll be out. Like, I'm definitely going to go to like Gen Con and like, PAX Unplugged, which oh, got totally. canceled yesterday. Uh, yeah, but I mean, a perfect example of this is uh, Netflix, um, the, the show Glow. Uh, it was greenlit for a fourth season. It was a popular show. And just last week, they canceled it because combination of they can't film it comfortably in that environment because it's a very physical show. Mm -hmm. um, but also, they didn't think it was going to land well in this current environment. Um, uh, so, I mean, this is a show that they were behind. Six months ago, they were fully in support of release and then retroactively rolled it back because this is just a huge difference. Movies that were shot you know, nine, ten months ago are, are, are launching in a very different environment now, and, and movie makers are making very different decisions on how to launch it. And that's just content that already existed. The content is being made now, and the, the media is being made in the future, and the games are being made in the future are having to take this into account, but also they're in the exact same boat. I don't know if the game I'm making now is gonna what's gonna look like in 2022 when it actually gets out out the door. Yeah. Um, I've got to make some guesses because that's the only way I can move forward. But you know, you're right. It, it's it's you have to kind of guess a little bit, but also try to make your products future proof as yeah. much as you can. Mm -hmm. well, and you have you know for for media like Brooklyn Nine Nine, the the comedy on Fox. Yeah. It's not the, 
the, the group of police officers, they have halted production. Well, like, they, they, they scrapped their four written episodes and are rewriting from scratch. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. They, they sort of were like, we need to go back and rethink this whole thing because the filter on police has changed. And you yeah. think about so many games where you're playing a police officer. And, and you think about, and, and this isn't, uh, you know, I met both Kate and Camden last year, but they released that One Child's mm -hmm. Heart game. Yeah, yeah. About, you know, helping with kids. But there was a lot of sort of controversy with it because, like, being a police officer was one of the sort of roles you could have in the game. And, you know, people were like, ugh, like they got, I mean, I have a friend and, and I'm not deflecting from that, but to sort of give another example, who saw the latest Batman thing was like, I like that Commissioner Gordon is a person of color, but I don't like cops <laughs> right now, you know? So they sort of had this sort of just like, like they, you know, there are people who sort of just want, they want their fantasy to be a fantasy. So they just want to sort of step back and be like, mm -hmm. I don't want to deal in a reality where there's police officers or something. So no. send me to pirates where like, hey, we're pirates. You know, we, we drink right. rum and we, we do pirate things. Um, and, and I feel bad, like for a perfect example is, is um, an indie game company did a fantastic video game called Disco Elysium. Um, it, they spent years on it. It's a wonderful, bizarre, weird game. It's a beautiful video game. And the main protagonist is a drunk police detective. Now, granted, there is a path you can take in the game where you decide that you get disillusioned with police work and you give it up. Right. But it's a possibility. Still, Dixie recommended it to me. I started playing it. This is really cool, but I'm going to put it back burner for a bit. And then all this happened. I picked it up a few weeks ago. And I said, I can't play this anymore right now. Yeah. I just can't at the moment. Well, yeah, because once, once we got into... Well, like, once we all realized that, like, propaganda was a thing. Yeah. You know, like, which, I mean... I've heard the term before. I always knew that, like, not all cops were perfect. You know, I was never like, yeah, go cops. But, like, at the same time, because I, I was a punk kid back in, like, the 90s and 2000s. Like, obviously, I didn't love right. cops. Um, but, like, at the same time, I didn't think they were all terrible people. And now I kind of do. Um, but also, like, yeah, it's the same. Like, I, I, I've had trouble playing Batman games since this started out. I was in the middle of Arkham City when all this started. Yeah. And then I started, like, I like booted up Arkham City and I was like, how many of these random people who are in Arkham City are in here on like an ounce of marijuana charge? I don't want to beat them up. <laughs> or like, yeah. like, I feel bad about this. So I just like, I haven't played any games that are anything like law enforcement related since it started because they all feel gross to me right now. You know, our world is complex and our games have been simple. And I mm -hmm. think that is just where things go. And you know, in the in the late 60s, early 70s, there was all these terrible movies, like Jaws. Um, I, mean, I mean, terrible movies. They were great movies. This but I think, if you think about Jaws, it ends, and only two good people on the good side live. The shark eats everybody else. And that was considered a positive ending, right? And then Star Wars came out and blew the doors off because finally a movie comes out where the good guys just clean win. Mm -hmm. right? they, just, they just win. And everyone felt like, finally, I just needed this break. I mean, aside from everyone who lived on Alderaan. Yeah, yeah, we never, we never met those people. They didn't really exist. And they were revenged. Revenged. Avenged? Avenged. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I, I think it'll be interesting to watch if the games getting created now are a little darker and a little bit, because we're all in a little darker place. Um, right. It's easier I, to write what you experience than write an imagined version. And then yeah. there'll be that breakout Star Wars to Jaws moment, right, that just sweeps the board clean and goes, okay, we're done. I know we've been talking a lot at our company about hope punk and the idea of hope punk. Mm -hmm. and how like that means like you you don't accept shitty things for what they are but you always strive for the better future even if that means like fighting the whole time even if that means that you're never going to stop fighting so the next generation gets something better yeah. um and that's that's i think a lot of where our heads are at right now is like we want for, for people to play our, our tabletop games you want them to feel like they're fighting the good fight and yeah up until like recent games i think most of the books i have of ours have it some point an example character who is an ex-cop that's just a common thing to put in a role-playing game is ex-cop ex-military ex-bodyguard something of that nature you know um i can't say if there going to be many of those in the future because uh, <laughs> I, I don't see that happening uh but at, at the same time going forward i think that like a lot of our games are about fighting against an unjust system or fighting to claim your place in the world and I think that that's a really prescient thing now, which is which is nice. Like a lot of our horror games aren't like grim dark. You're all gonna die. Splatterpunk horror. Most of them are like the world is horrible, but you can try to make it better. Sure. Right. Well, I think that's kind of like to at least to some degree with role playing games anyway. In particular, it's not necessarily with all uh, 
board games and all the other forms of tabletop games, but with role-playing games in particular, mm -hmm. that's sort of the crux of all games, really, when you think about it. Like, you're trying to, uh, even when it gets wildly uh, watered down, um, and even to the point of being too far watered down, like the whole situation with the fact that like all orcs are evil, like obviously that should not be the way that you're presenting it, but the characters themselves are typically the protagonists in a story that are trying to achieve some kind of greater good in the world. And that's generally the crux of role-playing games. Now, yeah, you do have your occasional spin-offs where, hey, we're going to play the bad guys this time and run it from that angle, or hey, we're going to just be the loot-hungry, greedy guys this time around. But the bulk of games that I typically see tend to be you're trying to be the good guy in a world that's kind of crappy and kind of mm -hmm. shitty. And... So, yeah, I think that that resonates even more right now. Like, I, that's a big reason why I think that there has been a, a large upsurge in the role-playing side of the industry specifically is that it does allow for that kind of fulfillment, um, especially in a time when, again, we, we all kind of feel trapped and helpless ourselves. So it allows us to affect the world around us, which is why, mm -hmm. like, one of the big things we at Hunters had uh, going on with the whole 2020 situation was for Outbreak Undead, I actually wrote a campaign setting. It's our uh, first one that we did called Zombie. And the premise that I used behind it was zombies that are actually a viral infection. Uh, oh. So the people aren't necessarily just undead monsters and there does have to be more thought about it. And there has to be more concern about like the transmission of the virus and how it spreads and things like that. And that came out like in in march um right when all of this was kicking off and we actually did have a large debate internally about it do we even do this anymore but mm -hmm. the reason mm -hmm. the main reason why we pushed forward is it was a kickstarter promised item to our backers so we were like well we did kind of already say that this was going to come out we kind of need to roll with it but what really freaked me out a bunch was a lot of what i put into that setting was how the world was starting to play out in reality. And I was, oh, I was yeah. very scared about the parallel between reality and the game. Um, and ironically enough, what we found is that it, it sold very well. It's already, a, oh. it, like, it quickly shot into a bestseller status over on Drive Through RPG. Um, yeah, I think I saw that one. Yeah, and I think, I really think it is just that kind of cathartic nature of it because it is very similar to the world that we find ourselves in now. But there are just enough differences within the construct of that role-playing setting that it still gives that level of agency. So I think that there will still be room even, uh, kind of touching back on what you were talking about before, Eddie, uh, moving forward for there to be kind of a space where we do still try to stick into the reality with some games mm -hmm. and utilize that what we actually see in the world right now and even have those coming out soon. Um, because I do think that there is a, there is a spectrum for that. Because again, with like Badhana Group, role playing is a therapeutic thing for people. And I think a lot of us have realized that more and more in 2020 mm -hmm. that it's not just a, a great way to kick back with friends and kill a few hours, but that it can actually help you deal with and potentially even resolve some mm -hmm. very deep seated things that are going on in your life. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that there will be still a kind of a place for that. And I'm actually very glad that we as a company ended up making that decision to go ahead and move forward because we really did debate it for a while of, do we just hold this back? Well, yeah. that's good because we're about to launch a game called the Contagion Chronicles. So that's yeah, good. I was just going to say, yeah. we actually had that issue too. We had a, a Kickstarter <laughs> for a crossover game called the Contagion Chronicle that was about a giant infection and the one across all kinds of things. <laughs> um, and it was a really cool premise when we started writing it in 2018. Um, and... <laughs> And then it became a thing that we were like, oh, Contagion's done. Yay. <laughs> How excited are y'all? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that's that's one of those things where, like, I mean, so that's, it's a similar interesting thing to, like, how um, when I was a, a younger person, when I was in my, like, teens, like, fighting fictionalized fascists or fighting fascists was a fictional thing. Like, yeah, there were a couple, like, there were some Nazi skinheads that hung out in, like, the punk scene where I lived, and we beat them up, because uh, fuck them. Um, and, like, that that was it. They were there to be laughed at, like, literally. Like, a lot of the industrial and goth scene actually adopted some of the, like, uh, kind of, you know, fascist uniformy imagery because we were poking fun at it. 
it, it, it was funny to us. Like it was in the past. It was so far ago. Like da, 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 da. let's let's subvert it with our you know fetish scene or whatever. And then like it came back, and now it's not funny anymore. And so you know we we play games where we fight against that 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 kind of stuff, and it was very like not real to us. And so there were all these games for years about. I mean, look at games like you know Plague Inc. and Pandemic and all these games that are about diseases, movies like Contagion, you know, whatever, where, like, it was just a fun, like, almost, like, sci-fi movie, and then the pandemic happened, and every, and, like, you know, if there are a few countries, ours included, that responded to it very terribly, and it's yeah. like, oh, no, this is real, and we probably shouldn't make light of it anymore. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, Nazis is a good example, because Nazis used to be, in, in all gaming, the one thing you were always allowed to kill without thinking about it. What? Yeah. The right. best villains, no one cared about them, and now they won like a third of the seats in the Greek parliament. Like it's just, it's just, it, like it's just crazy. Um, that now we have to be like, oh, my neighbor's a Nazi. Well, and, oh, and, and, and we should just the, kill them. I mean, that's like for some people, that's a thing. Yeah, but also like we have been, I, th I think on Xpath because like all of us on the main team are pretty leftist, and most of I think I think all of our freelancers are pretty leftist. Any of the ones that aren't have never said anything. Mm -hmm. Um. We are definitely putting like explicit like please punch Nazis in a lot of our books now. Yeah, for, for example, um, our pulp game, uh, the first edition of it, uh, adventure was set in nineteen twenties because at the time it was like we didn't want to set in the thirties because punching Nazis was cliche. Right. Um, and that then was back, we did, like, like twenty years ago. Right in the nineties, um, and so now we're doing a second edition of it, and we specifically moved it up to right before World War Two, so we can actually allow players to do that because now that's a it's not a reductive boring villain. It's a genuinely cathartic thing to do in a role-playing game. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. yeah, the uh, the the, camp the the mini campaign I ran sort of culminated in the, like, it's okay to, to kill Nazis. Like, you know, sort of that was the cathartic moment we worked through at the end. There was a lot of sort of touching moments before then, but then it was like, nope, they're wearing Nazi uniforms. Got them down. So do what you have to do. But it, I mean, it, it, so what, Nazis, the, the old orcs, is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> No, but it, well, because it that's, that's joining an evil ideology once again. People yeah. from all backgrounds can join yeah. an evil ideology but then and you become have, evil. But you have that sort of thing too, where like, you know, what do Nazis like? Well, Nazis love inglorious bastards, even though like the Nazis get killed there because the Nazis are shown to be strong. The Nazis do not love Hogan's heroes because the Nazis are shown to be inept. So you have that sort of thing, and people are like, "You should watch Jojo Rabbit." And I'm like. I'm not really good with, like, Hitler being, like, goofy. Right? Yeah, no, that, it's a super good movie. Like, no, I, for I've real. seen it, but what I'm saying is, okay. like, for me, it, 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 it brought up these sort of visceral sort of feelings in this. And so you think about your Nazis sitting at home, they're like, oh, I mean, sure, that's fantasy. I mean, they, they killed Hitler. That's not really what happened. Because the Nazis are perceived as strong there. You know, but Hogan's heroes, they're like, oh, that's dumb. That's not the way Nazis work. You know, so you, you do have that line, too, of sort of, like, uh, you know, and I'm not suggesting don't kill Nazis in games. I'm just sort of, it's that, it's that weird thing of like, you know, how much credence are you giving it? And how much are you sort of, you know, promoting that, you know? So I think if people have pledged to destroy my friends and family, that I do not really care about them. Oh, no, I, absolutely. I, 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 I'm, I'm my customers. totally with you there. <laughs> yes, I'll fire that customer every day. That's, yeah. that's <laughs> the funniest thing, actually, is when people on the on forums or on Twitter or whatever are like, Y'all used to be cool. Now you're SJWs, and we're like, first of all, it never were not that. Yeah. You just didn't notice it until now. Uh, second of all, bye. I don't want your money. Like, please don't give me your money. Please don't listen to my podcast. Please don't come in my space at all. I don't yeah. want you here. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So, if you worry about the people you're going to piss off, like, don't just. Just do the thing you have to do, and maybe other people will appreciate it. So Yeah, someone yeah. in our Discord the other day was like, you people disgust me, and this is why. And I'm like, okay, bye, ban. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, why are you in my Discord if we disgust you? Go, yeah. go, 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 go. Um, so we are at like 8.15. I, I would suggest we go for another five minutes or so, so people that have another event after this can run to the bathroom and do stuff. Is that good okay. with everyone? Sure. Yeah, that's fine. Um, if, if there are any questions for the, the, the people who've stuck around with us, feel free to, to ask. Or uh, So we can say, so we're talking about 2020. We're still not through it. We still have, uh, you know, a terrible three months to go. Um, well, hopefully a terrible month, and then things will brighten a little. But um, we'll see. Fingers crossed for, for that point in time, uh, for that magical Tuesday. Um, 
but like, you know, looking forward and, and Eddie talked about it, some sort of trying to prognosticate what sort of the future is going to be and trying to design games for, for the present, design games for the future. My turnaround for games is a lot quicker than, than you with larger companies. Like I, so this was a game I did for Game Chef a couple years ago and it was all about the president of a fictional company or country dividing the country up and sort of trying to, you know, sort of get them to work together and, uh, or to work against each other and how music could bring people back together. And uh, we have a whole section on there about violence and how like, it's not a game about violence. Like if you, you know, go up against a cop, you're gonna die. So, you know, back then, you know, three years ago when we released it, we were like, that's not reality. It doesn't matter, you know, what stats your gun has. There's no stats for your gun. But sort of working forward, sort of what are you thinking? Like I've heard, you know, sort of solo games and games like that, games that work in the virtual, you know, sort of space and, uh, you know, what other things are people excited about for 2021, either with our current reality or returning back to our old reality? I think in the tabletop space, the tactical or strategic tabletop space, you're going to start seeing a lot more games that don't touch on the social stresses of the day. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and by this, I mean like city building games <laughs> and, oh, you know, corralling dinosaurs in a pen um, you know, avoiding all the colonization issues. So like, which we did in our game, like we had pirates that went to islands, they didn't take them over. They were all deserted yeah. <laughs> before they got there. Right? Yeah. Pirate, um, pirates and pirates of Bugmire are, uh, are futuristic enough that they just think that pirate means like adventurer. Yeah. They learned the word from humans, like from fair. millennia ago. And they right. just assume it means adventurer sailor. They don't have any of the negative connotations of pirates. That's just great. Yeah. So, but, but, but I think you're going to see, because there's so much tension in the world, I think you're going to see people want to live in universes that are uh, a little, a little simpler and easier to manage. Word games, party games, stuff that, it, and not the Cards Against Humanities kind of stuff where it's about how do you say something gross and make a joke that you would never make in public so you can blame the game that made it. It's not me, right? Um, I think that we're going to see just, it, that's my guess. I know we're looking at games if something really strong comes around. Like I was working on a game a while back uh, about um, movements to get women suffragist movements. Uh, and it was, it was a, sort of a simulation of the different kinds of suffragette movements in England versus the ones in America. Mm -hmm. And it was a really good creative process, but the industry is, the world is not ready for that game right now because people are actively having their votes uh, taken away from them. Well, something in the game has to be the other side Right, that's trying to prevent you from getting the vote. Oh, I and know. If that thing is an automatron, it's the system doing it. I don't want to give you a game where you can lose. Mm -hmm. like, no, true, <laughs> true. I don't want to do that. Uh, now, there was a time where I would have happily done that game as a thought process, as a thing mm -hmm. for you to think about. I would not want to make that game today. It's a little too too heavy for um, it, what I think people are looking for. But I don't know. What do you guys think? We've got like two minutes left, and we got one question. No. Uh, so someone asked, "Is there any going back?" Uh, Will we ever get back to uh, normal uh, in the sort of tabletop uh, role-playing game space? Um, you know, to where we were before. So let's let's go back. Uh, let's go back a year and some to last year's Save Against Fear. Let's go back to the last Gen Con. Let's go to Dragon Con. Let's go to any any con like that where we can interact with people in person, where we can sit down at a real table and and make friends and and talk to people and be with people and share space with them. So, is there going back? What do we think? I would say uh, that. Oh, can I go ahead, Eddie? I was just gonna say um, the short answer is no. Yeah. Um, uh, we have but fundamental in a good way. changes in the industry. Just period. Um, some of it's for the better. I think a fair chunk of it's for the better. Um, I think the, the role of virtual play and digital space and solo play we talked about, I think those are going to stick around. Mm -hmm. um, I think the desire to be more inclusive and to get more people of color into our games is going to stick around. Um, and I think the way we conduct our conventions is just going to be fundamentally changed because it's not going to be a, there's a switch, a light switch and suddenly we're all going to go back exactly the way they were before. There's still going to be social distancing for a long time. There's still going to be flare-ups. There's still going to be procedures in place. So even when we have larger gatherings, they're still going to be, have to take these things into account for a long period of time. I think jokes about con plague are going to go way down because that's not funny anymore, you know? <laughs> yeah, like when, when con crud could be COVID, let's, let's not joke about right. con, con crud. 
Yeah, yep, now it's going to yep. be the, you know, before it was like, hey, you know, maybe, you know, sleep a little extra so you don't get sick. Now it's going to be the, you know, you wear your mask every day, you do this every day, you don't do these things, you don't shake hands with fans anymore for a while. Things are just going to change. Um, yep. And I think, frankly, we as an industry need to just wrap our head around that and, get, and be comfortable with that. Because if, if it does go back to quote normal, it's going to be several years. Yeah. I I think that once there is a vaccine, that the convention part of things will probably ease up back into normal fairly quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, once yeah. once there is like a, an easily gettable, distributable vaccine, whether that's in three months or a year, I'm not sure because mm-hmm. I trust the CDC and they haven't given us a definitive timeline yet. Um, that said, there are a lot of things I don't want to go back to normal because going back to normal was, you know, like that's like I want to move forward. So paying yep. lip service to like, oh yeah, we, we, we have a diverse team. And then we actually look at our team or look at like a team for a game. It's like, you know, two people of color, a bunch of like queer and trans folks. Cause that's, that's kind of how Onyx Path ends up being a, a lot of times on our books. It'll be like lots of queer and trans folks. Um, and then like a couple of POC, unless it's like Scion where we specifically like seek out people from various religions and, 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 and various cultures. Um, I don't want to be okay with that anymore. I want to keep standing up for that. I want to keep yelling about everything we've been yelling about all summer until it's all gone. Um, and I, I, I want to see folks have a seat at the table. Like I've been watching uh, Critical Bard and Tommy DePass and all them do all their like talks all summer, doing their Black as Fuck roundtables. Super awesome, incredibly important. Like trying to learn all. Like I have spent a lot of the summer listening, and. I mean, this this all sounds like performative allyship woke nonsense, and I'm sorry, but like ally is a verb, not a noun. So do what you can. Don't do anything about white supremacy. Stand up and keep doing that because this is not going to be like like if if Joe Biden gets elected on November third, this is not going to be over. Like I will yeah. I will sit here and vote for Joe Biden and go protest outside the White House the next day if I have to. Mm. And that's what I think we that's that's where we all need to be because we have to keep moving forward. Yeah. And so I don't want to go back to normal. But I do want my conventions back with like after con drinks and dinners and things. So hopefully a vaccine will make all of that possible again. Yeah, yeah, I think that's 100% accurate. Um, I, I think that the, from a broader angle, the industry is definitely not going back to normal and it's for, it, and it's in the most positive way possible. Right. Um, however, uh, I agree uh, with Dixie there is that I think when the, uh, vaccine finally gets out, at least from a convention perspective, we will eventually be uh, back to some sense of normal, but I, I would caution everybody to be prepared for it to be a long time. Like, I'm mm-hmm. I'm not a virologist, but since I do actually write for games that dive into that and I do research it a bit, I can definitely say that even when a vaccine gets made, like, you still have the time to produce enough vaccine to be able to distribute to the billions of people on this planet. Oh, yeah, like, I, uh, <laughs> I am not going to a convention until I personally yeah. have the vaccine shoved exactly. in my arm because I want to protect other people that can't get it. Exactly. I've, exactly. I've, I've got friends that can't get it. So, like, I don't think anyone should go to a con until they're vaccinated if they can be. So, yeah, just be prepared for that to be the long haul because I know that there's been a lot of good news recently about how there's been some progress on the vaccine side of things with all mm-hmm. of this. But we, we do got to keep ourselves tempered for a little bit, I would say. And just remember that, you know, there are still options. There, there's things like these online cons that you can do to still kind of get the feeling of that while we're trying to get transition back to all of this. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's going to be way better from a consumer standpoint. I think that mm-hmm. a lot of people during this close down are realizing how what a value games are and how mm-hmm. they are a reasonable way to spend time. And a lot of people I know who are board gamers are now playing games with their kids who never used to and because their friends aren't around. And so now those kids are going to be gamers. So yep. I just assume there will be a Yay. larger audience of gamers, especially in like the five to 10 year span. Yeah, okay. completely agree. Yeah. Well, I, it was great to, to, to see you all and to, to meet you. And uh, for those attendees who stuck around, thank you for sticking around. Uh, let's hope for another, uh, you know, a game. Uh, for the better. Let's keep pushing forward. Let's keep, uh, you know, sort of pushing the envelope of, of what games can be and what games can do and, and sort of their value uh, 
for personal use, their value for social use, and uh, their value as a, a sort of a mouthpiece for uh, things that need to be said. So um, thank you, everyone. And I hope that uh, I'll see some of you around at some other times. And if not, have a great convention. And for Alex, have a great conventions with the <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> jumping between the two back and forth. Multiple times. You can do it. Yeah, I've only and, been uh, I've only been chatting with our GMs a little bit while we were doing. This. <laughs> Fair enough. Absolutely. So, all right, everyone, it was it was great to meet you, and uh, have a great save against fear and other conventions, and yeah. be well, everyone. Stay See safe. You later. Bye. Bye. Stay Bye. safe.